In A Game of Thrones, Daenerys Targaryen travels through the lands of Southern Sarnor with Khal Drogo's Khalasar, on her way to the Dothrak. This, in itself, is a simple detail, quickly mentioned and forgotten. What if I told you, however, that the grasslands the Dothraki were traveling through were actually the grown over, ruined wastelands of many ancient civilizations that had roots in the Dawn Age, the world of ice and fire? A book written by Maester Yandel of the Old Town Citadel compiled the histories of an own world, and was gifted to Talman of the House Baratheon, a Westerosi king who ruled over the Seven Kingdoms. Among other things, it contained a lengthy passage about the grasslands of Essos and the Kingdom of Sarnor. I will be using Maester Yandel's writings as my main source, where the forests of Kohor and the Great Essosi grasslands begin. Made up of low hills, great blue lakes, and never-ending steppes, the grasslands stretch from the towering mountain range known as the Bones in the east to the forest of Golhor in the west. During the time period, known as the Dawn Age, the first towns were built on the banks of the river Sarn, all along its length towards the Shivering Sea. At this time, the continent of Westeros was only inhabited by children of the forest and the giants. There are, sadly, no histories left from those ancient days, as the various kingdoms of the grass rose and fell before those first men started writing. The knowledge we have comes from the legends passed down over thousands of years, which almost certainly means that they are mostly inaccurate. There were the Fisher Queens, who lived in the lands which bordered the Silver Sea, a body of water that used to cover the heartlands of the grasslands, but has since drained away. Most maesters do believe that the Silver Sea once existed, but over the centuries it has shrunken so much that only three great lakes remain. These fisher queens made their home in a floating palace which traveled around the coast of the Silver Sea. Wise men, lords, and kings all sought the counsel of the fisher queens, searching for their floating palace. As civilizations rose and fell all around them, the fisher queens lived on, it was said that their domains were favored by the ancient gods. Some maesters think that the first men originated in the grasslands, long before they traveled west towards the Arm of Dorn. The Endels might have also come from the land south of the Silver Sea. South of the ancient Silver Sea, not to be mistaken with the Shivering Sea north of Essos, ruled a race of savage hairy men who rode into battle atop horned horses. These savages were larger than the stunted Ebenese of the present day, but were close enough in appearance to have been their ancestors. The lost city of Liber was inhabited by acolytes of a spider goddess and a serpent god, who fought each other in an endless bloody war. To the east were mighty kingdoms, ruled by centaurs, creatures that were half men and half horse. Archmaester Hagedorn had a theory that the centaurs were actually mounted warriors, and that their neighbors had untamed horses at the time. This theory is widely accepted at the Citadel, even thought they have been centaur skeletons displayed before. South of the centaurs rose the ancestors of Aquathi, ruling their vast city-states. In the northern forests and the shores of the Shivering Sea lived the secretive Woodstalkers, which many believed to be kin to the children of the forest. Among others, there were also the Cyneri, who carved out their kingdoms in the hills, the long-legged Gips who went into battle with wicker shields and lime-stiffened hair. The brown-skinned Zakora, who rode into battle on chariots. Their hair was pale, almost like the Valyrians, who would come into the world many thousands of years later. Of the many civilizations I have listed, nearly all are gone. Their cities lie below the dirt on which the grasslands now grow. Their gods now rocks, which some might still find faint signs that they were once carved. Of the Kwafi city stites, only Quarf still stands, its wolf only a shadow of the past besides the guarded Jade Gates, which linked the Summer Sea with the Jade Sea. The ancestors of the Andals and the First Men remember their greatest conquerors long before they laid eyes on Westeros. These conquerors were the Sarnori, and at their height, the men of Sarnor ruled all of the lands watered by the great river Sarn, and all of the lands around the three great lakes, the last remnants of the ancient Silver Sea. The Sarnori called themselves the Tall Men, Taiga Fen, in their own language. They were tall, with black hair and black eyes, and their skin was brown, like the Zakari. They were warriors, sorcerers, and scholars, and they traced their lineage to the hero king called Hazor Ame, or Hazor the Amazing. Hazor was born from the last Fisher Queens. He married the daughters of the Saimiri, the Zakora, and the Gips, 
uniting the three civilizations under his rule. Hazaramai wore Saimer armor, the Saimiri being first to work metal. His cloak was the pelt of a slain king of a savage hairy man, and he rode a chariot which his Zakoran wife drove. The tall men at their heights were a proud people, but due to their infighting, they were divided. They ruled the western grasslands for centuries, and it was said that their cities were like gleaming white gems strewn across the green sheets, shining under the sun and stars. Their greatest city was Sarnath of the Tall Towers, home to the palace of the High King of Sarnor. His fabled palace had a thousand rooms. The High King of Sarnor had rule over the lesser Sarnori kings by law, but most High Kings never used their power. In the far east stood Kasaf, the city of Carvins. Safar was the waterfall city, lying between two branches of Asarn. Gornoth was by the lake, a city of canals. Salash by the silver shore was the city of scholars. Its library was vast. Further downstream, which would take us northward, closer to the Shivering Sea, were the great cities of Raphilar, Hornoth, and Kiev. These three cities served as great ports for many traders. Mardosh was the city of soldiers, and Mardosh was unconquerable. The port cities of Saf and Saris could be found on the shores of the Shivering Sea. The Kingdom of Sarnor was one of the greatest civilizations for nearly 2,000 years. And still, we don't have much information on it. What we do have comes from the summer and winter annals, the records from Slaver's Bay, Porth, and the Free Cities. The traders of Sarnor traveled as far as Yiti, Valyria, and even further to Lang and Asai. The ships of Sarnor sailed the Shivering Sea to Ib, the Thousand Islands, and Far Masavi. The kings of Sarnor made war against the Empire of Old Giz, the Quaifi, and the nomadic horsemen of the Eastern Steppes. The Sarnori horsemen wore steel and spider silk, riding coal black mares into battle. Their greatest warriors rode scythed battle chariots, pulled by teams of blood red horses. The chariots were driven by wives and daughters and sisters, as the Sarnori went to war as an entire people. Stories of Sarnor were known in the Seven Kingdoms as well, for Lamas Longstrider included the Palace of a Thousand Rooms in his book, Nine Wonders Made by Man. In the present day, the Kingdom of Sarnor is mostly forgotten, and there are many maesters in the Citadel who know little of its history. Their towers are no more, their cities abandoned ruins, their fields long gone, and no longer populated. Only the Kalisars of Adafraki travel these lands now, and the occasional caravans permitted by Kals to travel the Dothraki Sea in safety. These lands are known as the Great Desolation and the Haunted Lands. When Valeria was consumed by the Doom, the Dothraki horse lords came from the east with fire and steel to conquer the western realms. For all the time the Sarnori stood, their kingdom's fall took less than a hundred years. At this point, you might be interested in the Dothraki. If you are, I can tell you about their wars against the Kingdom of Sarnor, and against the vassals the Dragonlords left behind. The period following the Doom of Valyria was known as the Century of Blood, and it was rightfully named. In the West, the Free Cities became locked in a struggle to take up the crown left behind by the Valyrians, and in the Grasslands a new threat became clear, with no dragons to be used against them. The ambitious leader named Cal Mango was advised by his mother, the Witch Queen Dashi, and managed to unite the nomadic tribes. By the time Cal Mango had finished conquering and destroying the tribes that refused to join him, he was old with age. Cal Mango turned his gaze west. The tall men, who had previously been able to destroy any horse lords who packed at their eastern borders, ignored Cal Mango. When the Kalisar started raiding the eastern marches, the Sarnori once again ignored them. Instead, some of the tall men went as far as to offer the Dothraki gold and slaves to fight their wars for them. Cal Mango took their offerings and destroyed the enemy of the tall men. He then destroyed the fields and conquered lands as well. He believed that the earth was his mother and that to cut into it and plows and scythes was sinful. By the time the Sarnori realized that the Dothraki were a true threat, the Kalisar of Kalamoro, son of Kalamango, were already at the gates of Safar, the Waterfall City. The men of Safar were annihilated in battle, and the few survivors were put to the sword. The families of the warriors were enslaved and forced to march south towards Slaver's Bay. 
By the time Kalamoru marched the captured Tsarnori to the Giskari city of Hazdan Mo, three quarters of the Safarians were dead. Safar, the most beautiful city in the grasslands, was completely destroyed, and the leftover rebels were renamed Yali Kwami, or the place of the wailing children. The High King of Sarnor was powerless, and the lesser Sarnori cities of Kasaf and Gornaf sent forth their armies, marching towards the burning ruins of Safar. When the two Sarnori armies were only three days west of Safar, they annihilated one another, fighting a pitched battle over who would get to loot the ruins of Safar. Six years after the fall of Safar, Kalmoro raised Kasaf to the ground. One may find it hard to hear, but Kalmoro destroyed the great Sarnori city of Kasaf with the help of none other than the great Sarnori city of Gornaf. The king of Gornaf took one of Kalmoro's daughters as a wife and lived well for twelve years. His good life met its end at the hand of his own wife, who saw him too weak to rule. Kalhoro had slain Kalmoro and ended the line of mighty Kalmango, he took his Kalisar to Gornaf and took the city, marrying the late Gornafi king's wife. Horo was the final great Kal, and after his death at the hands of a rival, the Dothraki would never unite under a single leader again. The great Dothraki Kalisar splintered into twelve hordes and resumed their battles against each other. Each Kal wanted to show the others that he was the greatest, and in the following years, the Dothraki sacked and conquered vast territories. Most of the grassland cities were destroyed, and many of the people were enslaved. From each city, the Kals took the statues of those people's gods and brought them back to Vase Dothrak. One after the other, the cities of Sarnor fell as well. Only ashen ruins remained. Perhaps one of the greatest losses was the destruction of Salash, the city of scholars. When Salash fell, its vast libraries burned, and the histories of the Tallmen, and those before them, were forever lost. Keith and Harno followed, each destroyed and churned by rival cows, who wanted to add to their opponent's savagery. But finally, after so many years of destruction, the Kalisars came upon a different foe. The fortress city of Mordash the Unconquerable stood against the hordes for six years. The Dothraki hordes laid siege to the city, and the defenders were forced to eat their mounts and their animals, and then rats and mice and lesser creatures. The men of Mordosh became skeletal-like, and most no longer resembled men. They began eating their dead, devouring the corpses of our Mordoshi citizens. The skeletal corpse-eaters of Mordosh then turned their blades on their families and cut them all down. They then opened the gates and charged. The Dothraki slew every single man of Mordosh, and that was the end of it. The Dothraki named the ruins of the city Vase Korgi, or the City of a Blood Charge. When news of the fall of Mordosh reached the remaining Sarnori kings, they finally put aside their greed and infighting. From all over the Sarn, the tall men gathered, assembling beneath the walls of a high king city, Sarnath. They intended to destroy the Kalisars utterly and forever. Their great army was led by Mazar Alexi, the last Sarnori High King. This vast force marched east, near the ruins of Sarnath in the great grassy plains. This great army met four Kalisars. The field they fought on would forever be known as the Field of Crows. Cal Haro, Cal Lauso, Cal Quano, and Cal Zacco led nearly 80,000 horsemen. This Dothraki horde paled in comparison to the size of Mazar Alexi's Grand Army. 60,000 chariots, 10,000 armored horsemen, 10,000 light horse, and a 100,000 footmen. The charge of the chariots destroyed the Dothraki center, and Cal Haro was cut to ribbons and trampled beneath the chariots. His Kalisar broke and retreated, and the chariots gave chase. The High King and his armored horsemen, and the infantry charged in after, cutting down Halhoro's fleeing Kalisar. This, however, was all a trap. With the great Sarnori army now in the middle, Kalharo's men churned and unleashed volleys of arrows from their great boats. From the north and south came Kalquano and Kalzako, and Lasso the Lame took his Kalisar around to attack the Sarnori from the rear. The tall men were completely surrounded. On that day, Mazar Alexi, the last Sarnori High King, and six lesser kings were slain, along with a hundred thousand men. Soon after this colossal battle, Lasso the Lame sacked Sarnath, putting the city to the torch and destroying the palace of a thousand rooms. As Sarnath fell, the remaining cities of the grasslands fell as well. The century of blood was coming to an end, and so too, the end was coming for the kingdom of Sarnor. Saris was the final Sarnori city to fall, destroyed by Kal Zeko. 
of the millions of tall men who once made their home along the Sarn. Only 20,000 remain in the sad port of Saf, the final city of the tall men. The only reason Saf still stands is because the Ibanis and the people of Alaraf supported through their colony of Morash. There, they still call themselves Tagazfen and worship their Sarnori gods. With the kingdom of Sarnor finally destroyed, the Valyrian colony of Viseria, known to many as the Lost Three City, was sacked by the growing hunger of the Dothraki hordes. Asaria was renamed Vase Kedak, the city of corpses. In the north, near the Shivering Sea, Keldako burned the Ibanis city of Ibish, ending their claim on Essos. Some cows took their hordes south to the Red Wastes, destroying the ancient towns of the Quaifi, leaving only Karth untouched. In the far west, at the border of the grasslands, Kaltemos Kalisar was defeated at Kolhor by the spears of 3,000 unsullied warriors. Most understand that it's only a matter of time before the Dothraki are united under a new great cow who takes the hordes west again. In the east, the Dothraki have had greater troubles. Their attempt to expand have been halted by the Bone Mountains. There are the only three passages across the bones, each guarded by a mighty fortress city. By Ashabad, Samirina, and Kaya Kaya Yanana. <laughs> They are defended by powerful female past guardians, descendants of the Kingdom of Harkun, which used to stand in what is now the Great Sand Sea. Many Kalisars have met their end trying to conquer the passages. To this very day, no man farms the grasslands or builds their home upon them, for they fear the mighty Kalisars. The Dothraki rule the Great Grass Sea, the Great Kalisars fighting each other upon the endless fields. Sometimes, the Magisters and Triarchs of the Three Cities send great gift to the cows to remain in their good favor, or to steer them back when they wander too far west. The only permanent city of the Dothraki is Vez Dothrak, ruled by the Dashkalin. This city lies beneath the Mother of Mountains, a single, lonely peak. Widows of fallen cows come to Vez Dothrak to become crones. No bloodshed is allowed in the city, for it's a peaceful and holy place. The Dothraki don't buy or sell, but merchants that come from the free cities and from beyond the bones do. Vez Dothrak is the true gateway between east and west. The Horse Lords believed that one day, all Kalisars will unite at Vez Dothrak, beneath the banner of a stallion who will mount the world and conquer all. That's just about everything I have for you today. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, leave a like to let me know. If you want to be notified, Whenever I upload a new video, click the subscribe button and the little notification bell. If you did not like this video, let me know in the comments what about it was bad so that I can try to improve in the future. Once again, thank you all for watching and I hope to see you soon.